Let's open in our Bibles to the last verse of Genesis 3. You're turning to a time in what I call the lost world. This is the antediluvian. That's the before the global flood world. The world in which, mathematically, if children, as I said last week, are begotten at just half the current rate of, of uh, fertility in this world, there were about 7 billion people who lived before the flood. But we're not looking at that. That's coming in the future, the deluge and the dinosaurs and all that stuff. This morning, we're going to a little pile of rocks outside the Garden of Eden. The little pile of rocks that were piled up that was an altar. An altar on the east side of Eden, outside of the garden. A blackened, soot-covered place where fire had burned, splattered with the blood of animals where Adam and Eve worshipped God. And what we're going to look at is just one thought this morning, and that is the awesome, holy presence of God. And we're going to see that especially as we look at that altar and those angels that the scriptures tell us surrounded that altar in Genesis 3, the last verse, verse 24. Because this morning we want to go back to the lost world. We want to go back to that pile of rocks outside the Garden of Eden. We want to look again at those blackened stones with fire stained with the blood of countless animals because it is here that we can learn about how God Revealed his holy presence. I want you to think with me about two little boys who experienced that altar with their parents. Those boys were Cain and Abel. The Bible refers to Abel as righteous Abel. In fact, the book of Hebrews lists off the heroes of the faith, and the first one standing at the head of the list is called righteous Abel. God said he heads the list of God's faithful, heaven bound servants. We need to follow his example. But also in the lost world, we're going to meet Abel's brother, Cain. And God warns us that Cain is the one who started a way of life that leads to the most dreadful ending there could be. In fact, the Bible calls Cain's life the way of Cain. That's the book of Jude's description of of Cain. And the way of Cain leads to death without Christ, death with one's sins still upon a person, Death eternally in the blackness of hell, facing the horror of God's wrath forever. Well, we need to take heed to the bad example of Cain. And we need to avoid at all costs the way of Cain. And to experience these elements and lessons of the lost world, the mysterious part of human history, involving those billions of people who were alive on this planet before Noah's flood, We have opened to the last verse of Genesis 3. And I'd like you to stand with me as we read from Genesis 3.24 down through chapter 4, verse 5, as we are coming before God's holy presence. Follow along with me as I read. So he, that's God, drove out the man, he placed out the man, and he placed cherubim. That, by the way, is the first reference to these angels in the Bible. At the east, it says, of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. The end of verse 4. Let's bow together. Father in heaven, we come before you. We acknowledge your awesome, holy presence. And coming into your holy presence, we ask that you would open our eyes. Help us to see from your word here and in other passages we're going to turn to this morning. Some of the elements, some of the the awesome elements of your holiness, which cause those who experienced it to quake, to feel undone, 
to acknowledge their sinfulness and lostness, and it caused others to be hardened and to turn away. I pray that we would feel undone, that we would feel how grateful we are for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that your blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness so that we do not have to fear. But I pray it would also be a time of warning because in a group this size, there are no doubt some Cains present who grow up being taught about the way to God, the place of worship, and the way that you want to be worshipped. And yet, they will turn their back on that truth. I pray that this morning, hearts will be softened, our worship will be focused, and that we will celebrate your precious blood poured out for us. Teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look back at verse 24 with you because there's one little word in there that I have to confess in all the times I've read through the Bible, the book of Genesis, these verses. I've never paid attention to that one word, cherubim. And this week, the longer I read and the more I read, the more my heart was drawn to Why does God tell us that there were cherubim? And why is that the first reference to one of the four orders of angels that are in the Bible? We know that there are the normal angels, messengers of God. Then there are the archangels who always stand facing God. In fact, Revelation tells us there are seven of them. Two are mentioned by name, Gabriel and Michael. Then it said there are seraphim, and these are the burning ones who go to the altar and get the coals. But then there are a fourth group which we're going to meet this morning, called the cherubim. That's the plural of a cherub. Now, all of you know one cherub by name. The only one we know by name, his name is Lucifer. He was the anointed cherub who fell to become Satan. But here it says, in verse 24, that after God drove the man and woman out of Eden, he placed cherubim. At the east side. Now, God's word is so fascinating. And if we just slow down and look closely at the scriptures, they all start fitting together. And so it is with this story of Cain and Abel. And if we want to understand the enormity of God's love and experience the reality of his revelation, of his way of salvation, and if we want to shudder at the gravity of Cain's sin, at his heart being so hard, all we have to do is look at that one word, cherubim. Cherubim always speak of God's holy presence. The cherubim are always associated with being a surrounding, facing group of four angels that always face God's holy presence. They never turn their heads. They never turn away. They're always facing his holy presence. And God tells us that he placed those guardians of his holy presence on the east side of Eden. Now, if we kind of put together a few clues, you can figure it out. When God built something on the earth, he gave some plans for Moses to build a tabernacle. He told him to situate the tabernacle so that the only doorway to the tabernacle faced to the east. And when you would come through that doorway, coming in from the east, the first thing you would bump into is an altar. And so it was in the temple that followed, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple that was a rebuilding of the destroyed Salmonic temple, and then finally Herod's temple, which was an enhancement of Zerubbabel's. Every one of them had the same configuration. Eastern entrance, burnt altar, the first thing you touch when you come in to the temple area, the tabernacle. That's what God wants us to see He wants to tell us that when Cain and Abel were brought up outside the Garden of Eden, that what Cain experienced on a regular basis was God's holy presence. Well, in the lost world, verse 24, there are just a few clues. But if we take a moment to look and study what I call a cherubimology, okay? It's a study. Angelology is the proper term. We're going to study cherubim through the scriptures. And if you'll just track with me, I think you will realize what an awesome thing it was to have lived back then just outside of Eden and to have gone to the east side of Eden, to have gone to that place of sacrifice. Verse 24 tells us, One word, 
which we'll spend a, a great amount of time in the Scripture studying this morning. First of all, cherubim always speak of God's holy presence. Let me just read to you from a theological dictionary this morning. If you looked up in a Bible dictionary, a big thick one, the word cherubim, this is what you'd find in there. Cherubim are the highest order of class or created beings of indescribable power and beauty. Their main purpose in the Scripture and activity might be summarized in this way. The cherubim were the proclaimers, the protectors of God's glorious presence, of his sovereignty, and of his holiness. So what do we have in verse 24? We have cherubim standing guard over two very special places. They stood guard over the tree of life. But I believe also they stood guard over an altar. For you see, the cherubim surrounded the place where God's holy presence was to be approached. And God did not leave Adam and Eve without a place to come before him. And that place that he designated was a sacrificial altar, because that's the only way God can be approached, is through the sacrificing and the shedding of blood. In the Old Covenant, numerous times. In the New Covenant, once and for all through Christ. Later... These figures, these cherubim, show up in Exodus 25. You don't have to turn there, but they were the golden figures. And they always show up in fours. There are never just two, there are four. And what we find in Exodus 25 is there was this little place called a mercy seat. And on either side of the mercy seat, bending over and looking downward, are two cherubim, one cherub on each side. Then on the ends of the Ark of the Covenant are two more of these cherubim. And so the four of them, it says in Exodus 25, always were facing the mercy seat and the place of God's presence. It's very interesting that in the New Testament, when the women came to the tomb at resurrection morn, do you remember that in John 20 and verse 12? When they rushed in, there were angels. And the angels said, come on in. And when they came in, they looked inside and they saw an angel sitting at the head of the little shelf where Christ had been laid and another angel sitting at the foot. And it's almost like a little mercy seat where the perfect sacrifice once and for all was laying prior to the resurrection that those angels were sitting there looking down at the ultimate mercy seat. Just a little sidelight to think about. Because Jesus Christ on the cross had made himself the true and eternal mercy seat for sinful humanity. And so the angels were present watching. The most uh, amazing, though, description of the cherubim are in the book of Ezekiel. Now, some of you might not know where that is. If you open right to the middle, you'll probably hit the Psalms. Keep going to the right to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the 26th book of the Bible. Probably not very often read by most of us. But it is really good reading, especially the first chapter. Turn there with me, please. Ezekiel chapter 1. And what I'm going to share with you is a little study of the cherubim in the book of Ezekiel. Because in Ezekiel, we find Ezekiel the prophet and the priest with a vision of God's holy presence. And what we find in Ezekiel is that every time God's holy presence is revealed in the scripture, these living creatures are surrounding him and facing him. These cherubim, they have four wings, they have feet like a calf, they gleam like burnished bronze, and they surround the glory of God. And Ezekiel, in chapter 1, gets to see God's holy presence. The book of Ezekiel is uh, an Old Testament book recorded by an Old Testament saint who had learned the joy and blessing of feasting on the whole counsel of God. Now, the book of Ezekiel has a lot of hard stuff in it. And what's amazing about Ezekiel is that even the hard sayings of God became very delectable to him. And as we progress in our sanctification, especially in this new year, we should, like Ezekiel, develop an appetite for all the Word of God. And we should want to know God and want to grow in our understanding of His Word. The prophet Ezekiel was a victim of the Babylonian captivity. He had been deported from his homeland of Israel. He'd been carried off to an alien pagan nation. And he saw in verse 4, as he sat by a river called the river Kibar, he saw a glorious vision of the very presence of God. Let's start in verse 4, and we'll kind of pick it apart a couple verses at a time. This vision of God's glory. Verse 4, And I looked, Ezekiel records, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud of fire enfolding itself. Brightness was about it, and in the midst thereof the color of amber, 
out of the midst of the fire. Now, the elements of verse 4 are there's this whirlwind, a cloud, fire, and that is always the picture of theophany, be it, uh, if you've ever heard of that word, theophanos, uh, an appearing of God. Because God is a spirit, he doesn't have a body. That's why Jesus is God the Son incarnated. God is an eternal spirit, the Father, and does not have a corporeal body. And so he emanates this glorious cloud and shows his presence by that cloud. So that's what Ezekiel's seeing, a visible manifestation of the invisible God. Moses saw a similar cloud when he saw the burning bush. The Israelites followed a similar cloud, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. And all the way through the scriptures, we see manifestations or appearances of a glory cloud, which in the Bible is called the Shekinah. And if you remember, once the tabernacle got built, that this pillar of fire, the Shekinah glory cloud, just came out of the roof of the tabernacle, and it just glowed there and burned there, and it seems to have been kind of like a light which lit the whole camp of Israel for 40 years. They didn't need street lights or lamps. It just lit the whole place up. It was a dazzling, bright, radiant cloud. Now, Starting in verse 5, let's just start thinking about what would be the human response to seeing that, to seeing this enfolding, radiant, dazzling emanation of the glory of God and God's holy presence and how it affected those who experienced him. Ezekiel sees this manifestation of divine glory. And Ezekiel, like all the other people in the Scripture, is overwhelmed by the sight. Starting in verse 5, out of the midst thereof, this is Ezekiel's vision, it's very similar to what Isaiah saw and what John saw in Patmos, out of the midst of this fiery cloud came the likeness, verse 5 says, of four living creatures. Now just in your mind, remember that, because we're going to see that in Revelation. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, everyone had four faces, Everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet. The sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. That's interesting. Basically, this description of these four creatures explains to us what must have been the appearance of the cherubim around the altar of Genesis 3. God says these creatures, these cherubim, are there. What do they look like? Well, it describes them right here. God's cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, the ones with the flaming swords guarding the tree of life and also protecting the place of God's holy presence so he could be approached, resemble the four beasts that are around the throne in Revelation chapter 4. Now, look at verse 8 of uh, Ezekiel 1, because these creatures move in an unusual way. And let me just preface reading 8, 9, and 10 with telling you a little bit about this. What Ezekiel is trying to explain is something he had never seen before. So he's kind of grasping for words, and the Spirit of God is, is putting words on his tongue, and he's recording kind of this overwhelming experience while he's just kind of getting ready to collapse. In fact, it says he just falls on his face after he sees it. But what he's seeing is the way that these cherubim move And different writers, if you read commentaries like I do, there are more bizarre speculations. One of them says this is obviously Ezekiel witnessing an ancient visitation by aliens in a flying saucer. I mean, isn't that quaint, you know? But the origin of these four creatures is not Mars or Venus. This is an appearance of the very presence of a holy God. And they came from the abode of heaven itself, from God's presence. Here's what Ezekiel says in verse 8. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides. And they had four faces and their wings. And their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. He says they didn't turn their back and go this way. They just went in every direction. They went, everyone, straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. So it was man on the front, eagle on the back, ox on the left, lion on the right, and they always were in that configuration. Now you say, what is that about? Well, 
These four living creatures, as you read through chapter 1, seem with their wings to have their wings up, supporting the platform of God's throne. In fact, Ezekiel, we're not going to read it all the way through, but by the time you get to verse 26, he's describing Revelation chapter 4, this throne of God, and you see the appearance of a man on the throne, which is God the Son. And these cherubs, or cherubim, have their wings holding up this platform where his throne is. So, they are always facing him, and they're holding up this platform. It's just, a, just an unbelievable sight. They had quasi-human forms. They stood upright. They had a human face. They had human hands, yet they were terribly different than normal human beings because they had four faces, four wings, and feet that were like the feet of calves. You say, why? Well, just think for a minute. As we closely study these four-faced creatures... They seem to represent the highest forms of created life. Man, the highest of God's created creatures, is mentioned first, and he faces the presence of God, which is a real privilege for us, that that we are the ones, the recipient of God's presence. The lion on the right is considered the king of the wild beasts. The ox on the left was the king of domesticated animals, and the eagle, the ruler of the sky, the greatest of the winged creatures. We've already studied these creatures in Revelation 4, where they're described as four living ones or beings. These are the cherubim, the angels connected with God's presence, power, and holiness. What John adds, though, even though his description differs a little bit, obviously he's talking about the same creatures. John adds in Revelation 4, 7, and 8 that these creatures were full of eyes. So these faces, I mean... I'm building this up because two little boys got to see this. Can you imagine Cain and Abel? I mean, every direction, those things were looking at them. They could come from around the corner, and those faces were always facing them. Kind of like the super mom, you know, sees you everywhere you go in the house. Only this was the super sight of God. Cherubim are not omniscient. That's an attribute only for God. But these angels with the eyes surrounding their four faces were comprehensive knowledge and perception that were visibly displayed that nothing could escape their scrutiny. The biblical writers of the time after the apostles later used these four faces as symbols for the four gospels. They said that Matthew was depicted in Christian art as a man, Mark as a lion, Luke as an ox, and John as an eagle. Those were just the way the the catacomb Christians drew pictures uh, of art on the wall. They picked up these four cherubim figures. These four cherubims formed a perfect square. In fact, we're going to look at verse 11 where it talks about, it says, uh, verse 11 says, their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined to the other and two covered their bodies. What that means is they were four square. That's how Ezekiel calls them, which indicates perfect symmetry. No matter which direction you observe these creatures, a different face was seen on all of them. Now think about it. If you were standing at this angle, you'd see the face of an ox, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, and the face of a man. If you came and looked at them from this angle, you'd see the same four faces. No matter which way you approach the presence of God, you saw the same four faces. That's why they're four square. So that they would always be the closest face to you, a human face, the face on the left, an ox, the face on the right, a lion, and the one to the rear would be the eagle. These creatures were linked together by their wingtips. Two wings of each creature stretched out to touch the other ones, resembling the outspread wings of the cherubim who guarded the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25. The other two wings would shield their body from God's divine glory. These, the two up, supporting a platform, the other two shielding themselves from God's glory, give us this picture. Look at verse 12. And they went, every one, straight forward. Whither the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. You see, he's just kind of trying to describe this. Never saw anything like this before. Like the appearance of lamps. You know, this is a 6th century B.C. guy trying to describe something so high-tech. We don't comprehend it today, and we think we're so smart. And he's seeing it. And he says their appearance was like 
like burning coals, like lamps. And verse uh, uh, 13 continues, It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Wow. I mean, just boggling. Okay. Well, what all this says is that in the center of this hollow square made up by these four living creatures was a bright fire, burning coals, lamps, punctuated by flashes of lightning. And these images are all suggestions of God's holy presence. Now, what happens when people come into God's presence? Think about it for a minute. Whenever we find God's holy presence manifested in the scriptures, the people that see it feel a dread. They are amazed. They, they kind of feel like they're being swallowed up. They start quaking with fear. They feel feeble. In fact, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 6 that he was dissolving, disintegrating, coming apart. In fact, if we use 21st century language, we'd say he came unglued. He lost his cool. He was coming apart at the seams. He was going to pieces. He was being shattered. All of those were the realization of coming into God's holy presence. Now, let's go back to Genesis 4 and wrap this up. All that cherubimology, to remind you that verse 24 says, on the east side of Eden were cherubim. Cherubim are always associated with an altar and a mercy seat. Cherubim are always associated with the holy presence of God. So think about the rich earth that flew beneath the chubby little feet of two little boys. It was Saturday again, and every Saturday, Mom and Dad always took them back to that high wall around that big garden and to the little place outside the wall where there was an altar. There, little Cain and Abel would watch every week in tearful reverence as their parents killed a beautiful white lamb and with crimson-stained hands would place the lifeless body of that innocent lamb on the blackened rocks. And then, pouring the blood of the lamb around the base, they would ignite a fire and burn that lamb atop a pile of wood on top of the rocks. The family had done the same thing every week for as long as those little boys could remember. Every time, the same story was retold by Adam to his family. He said how he used to have wonderful walks with his creator. And then the fateful day they chose to disobey. And then their awful eviction from paradise. And then the growing curse as thistles and weeds began to grow in the soil of the planet. But every week, Adam always came back to the same conclusion. With wide eyes, the boys heard about how God had set up this altar And how God had told Adam and Eve that this was the only place now that they could meet with him. And this bloody sacrifice that they were now offering was the only key to pleasing God and covering their sins. Well, the one part that never grew old for those little boys were those amazing cherubim with those four faces covered with eyes. It always seems one of them was looking right at you no matter which direction you came from. Those guardians of God's holy presence were what were instilled on Cain and Abel's minds. Now look at verse 3, because time goes by. In fact, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve had their next born son when Adam was 129 years old. So that means that Cain and Abel were at least 129 years old. Cain was, at least. He was the firstborn. And so a long time had gone by. When this event occurs, it could have been the whole 120 some years. It could be just 20 or 30 or 40 years, but whatever, they were launched out into independence. No longer did they have to come with mom and dad to the altar. Now Cain and Abel came on their own. And look what happens. Verse 3, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought his offering and Abel brought his offering. Just three things I want to teach you. Number one, Cain and Abel were taught they had to go to a specific place to worship God. You notice what it says here. Cain and Abel brought an offering. If you bring something, you're going somewhere. They brought it. They didn't just walk around looking, you know, saying, hey, I've got my stuff, God. Where do you want me? They went somewhere. They went to a specific place. They went to this altar, most likely. Although there's no record of this altar being built. 
it was an altar because it was a place of sacrifice. And it already existed when they went there. And most likely it was on the east side of Eden where God put those cherubim. This would be totally consistent with God's grace. Because from the beginning, God provided a means for him to be worshipped. And with the cherubim standing guard over that altar, this was a forerunner of the mercy seat, a place where man could come for forgiveness and atonement. And here on the first page of man's history comes God's promise of a future deliverer as he provided a temporary means for them to worship him and sacrifice. So number one, there was a place they went to, but look look back at verse 3. It says, in the process of time. My Bible has a marginal in the center column references at the end of days. Literally, it says at the end of the days. What does that mean? What's the last day of the week? The Sabbath day. So they had a specific day they were supposed to come. A a time God set up. They didn't just wander around all week long with their offering, wondering when God wanted it. God had revealed to them a place and a time. And they knew an exact terms what that time and place was. But I also believe one last thing. You notice it says in verse 4 that Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord had respect. I personally believe God had revealed a way to come before him. I don't think that Adam and Eve accidentally stumbled on this idea of a sacrifice. It's amazing that they had to have known what God expected. And here in Genesis 4, the first recorded act of worship in the Bible was a bloody sacrifice. Of course, we know from Abraham and from Moses that God's covenant always involves sacrifice. And at the heart of the new covenant is Jesus' perfect once and for all sacrifice. So it would be inconceivable to think that one day Cain and Abel just kind of happened on this idea of sacrifice. No, Hebrews 11 and verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered his sacrifice that was acceptable, and Cain didn't. Why? Because God had revealed he wanted a a bloody sacrifice of a lamb with his blood poured out as the way he was to be worshipped. Well, God revealed a place of worship. God revealed a time of worship. God revealed a way to be worshipped. And I believe that these two boys have been taught this by their parents. I wonder at this beginning of the new year, parents, are you teaching your children how to worship God? How to come to Him? What He expects from them? How to live forever in His presence? And I wonder, young people, are you listening to your parents? Are you going to be righteous like Abel? Are you going to go the way of Cain? And turn your back on God, as Cain did. Well, I want to close this study with a hymn. This is the famous hymn, Rock of Ages. But the third stanza is built upon this moment in history of Cain and Abel coming. And Cain brought everything that he thought was pleasing to God that he could do. And Abel brought nothing that he could do. He brought a substitute. He brought a lamb. And hymn number 204, Rock of Ages, the third stanza, captures this moment. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. I think that's exactly what was on Abel's heart on that fateful day so long ago.